Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I've actually been outside doing some imaging after a long work imposed break, and I think I might have shut down a Starlink satellite. I've been using the GT81 going after a couple of nebula targets here before I have to switch over to galaxy season, but I did manage to step on a slippery slope and bought the ASI 2600mm, the new 2025 version. Just wanted to see what that thing was like. I have the filter drawer, so I've filled those up with the Antlia 3 nanometer SHO filters and the LRGB filters that are two inch mounted filters. So those are in the filter drawer at the moment, or at least one of them is for right now. And as I say, I'm using the GT81 with the 1X flattener, so it's not being reduced at all. It's imaging at the full focal length of 478 millimeters. And I've been trying to collect some data on the Flaming Star and the Rosette Nebula during this little period of uh, getting reacclimated to uh, doing astrophotography again. And after I was going through the images after one night, I noticed something peculiar in one of the frames in the Rosette Nebula. Let's take a look. This is a S2 frame, so there's there's some decent signal here. And this frame looks pretty good. This subframe looks pretty good. Obviously, we always have to go through our subframes every morning after a night night's worth of imaging just to call out the airplanes that don't seem to get uh, captured by the pixel rejection algorithms. Typical satellite trays will get cut out by the, the uh, image rejection algorithms in PixInsight, but the airplanes, I always have trouble with those and usually just throw those away. And of course, if you have some clouds come in, then uh, surely you have to throw those out. And this is a pretty good one. It looks like all the other good SIM frames that I had from that night. But something stood out to me as being just a little odd. I caught my eye, and it's right there. You see that little streak? It's not star-like. And if we go ahead and zoom in on it, we can see that it has real structure to it. It kind of starts off faint and then it builds up. You can see it's got some, there's some motion uh, across the frame here as I image this thing. This is a 10 minute long subframe. So this has had time to sit there and, and uh, move around a bit. And it Builds up to a maximum size and brightness and then goes back down to dim. So this is clearly some sort of artifact, some sort of anomaly that I saw. It's not uh, an anomaly of the camera. It's not an anomaly of a, it's not a signature of a typical satellite. A typical satellite, of course, we just see a bright white line, thin line go through our images. We don't see this kind of behavior here. So it's very odd to see this. And I looked it up on Google that next day and asked if there was some space debris perhaps that had entered the atmosphere and burned up or maybe a meteorite uh, had burned up and re-entering or entering the atmosphere. And Google sent me to this several links to a Starlink post about one of their satellites. And here's that post. It said on December 17th, I was shooting this image on December 19th, so it's pretty close. It said that they experienced a, an anomaly with their satellite 35956. And they lost communication with the satellite. It vented propulsion. That's essentially causing the satellite to tumble. Uh, it's in a rapid decay right now. And it will re-enter the atmosphere here shortly. But it wasn't on this night. And it released a few, a small number of debris that it didn't explode. But it did release some debris that's kind of flying along with it, apparently. And it's just tumbling. And it'll re-enter here within a few weeks. Now, that was within a few weeks of December 17th, so now we're talking within a few days. So keep your eyes open for some note that a Starlink satellite is re-entering the atmosphere and will uh, is, is expected to burn up. But my image being from the 19th, I just wondered if this satellite was continuing to experience an anomaly and if it's possible that that's what I caught accidentally, of course, in my one subframe of the Rosette Nebula. So what else could it be? Let's take a look at where the ground track would have been if it were, in fact, the Starlink satellite. Now, here's a great circle just the of the Earth, and it's I've got it's not a not a longitude line. It's a line or it's a circle that's in a plane that contains the center of the Earth, my location on the Earth, and the location of the anomaly as I imaged it uh, on that night. And what you can see here is I have the radius of the Earth here. I have the height of the, in this case, the Starlink satellite above the Earth. And I've got this angle. It's this angle here that I'm particularly interested in. But I do know some of these things here. I certainly know the radius of the Earth and 418 kilometers square the satellite was. It's moving along at 7.7 
kilometers per second. That doesn't really play into what we're talking about here, but it is a known variable. And of course, for the FITS header, I can look at the FITS header of my image and find out what the center of the image was. And the altitude was at 52.3 degrees and the azimuth was at 228.8 degrees. Now I just need to use this information and solve for theta to figure out how far away this anomaly was when I captured a picture and if that makes sense for where the satellite would have been. Once we go through a bit of math, I'll spare you the details of that. I find that this theta is actually pretty small here. This angle is only about like 2.7 degrees, which means that the anomaly along this line, my line of sight here, was about 518 kilometers. And if I wanted to walk over to the ground track location at the time that anomaly occurred, it would be a 295 kilometer walk. But it looks like it's actually very close to my location. And if it is, in fact, the Starlink satellite at 418 kilometers, the ground track latitude and longitude were about 32 degrees north, plus or minus a degree, and minus 98 degrees west, plus or minus a degree. So somewhere in there is where this anomaly occurred. And so what I'm curious about is, can I find an orbital path for this satellite that would put it through that location on the Earth? Is that reasonable? One thing we can do, Stellarium has these uh, many of the satellites in its database. You can download other databases. And I did download the Starlink database, and the funny thing is, when I would check out the location of this particular satellite, 35956, it always seemed to be in a location that was at odds with what their satellite tracking websites would place it at. So that was kind of weird, and I just went back in before I started recording this video and checked to see what the satellite information was within uh, Stellarium to see maybe if they had updated it. And lo and behold, there's 35955 and 35957. It looks like they've deleted 35956 from this database, and now you can no longer use Stellarium to pull up its uh, ground track location. And then what I was trying to do was to go back in history a few days and see if its pass was uh, right through my image as I was expecting it to be. So I can't confirm it with Stellarium now. That means I've got to use some other satellite tracking websites to see if I can get some insight into where this orbit was and whether it's reasonable that it would have passed so close to my location as I was doing the imaging and observed that anomaly. Just the other day, I was on one of those websites, and you can see the Starlink 35956 here. The track you may not be able to see on YouTube it comes down from the northwest and goes to the southeast. And as the Earth rotates, these tracks will go at various uh, places around the Earth here. And here is my location. Here's the orbital path on this particular time. It was December 29th, and it was passing right through. I'm estimating that my location, where I observed what I think was this satellite, it must that ground track that we see here must have been right through here. So that's what I wanted to confirm just historically, if that makes sense, that it would be passing through that close to where I live. If that's the case, I can look back through the upcoming passes. Now, I did this probably a couple of days after I took the image and called up the satellite. And sure enough, there are a number of locations here, a number of times, and then the corresponding location about where it would be, where it can be seen from my location on the Earth to the satellite. And sure enough, back here on December 24th, it looked like there was going to be at an azimuth of 234 degrees. It's saying that it's going to be visible from my location. I observed it at 229 degrees. And at an altitude of 50 degrees, I observed it at 52 degrees. So this particular pass here is very close to what I had seen with my anomaly. So it does seem very reasonable that Starlink satellite 39956 would pass right by my location and would be observable at the azimuth and altitude that I did, in fact, observe my anomaly. So a funny thing happened on the way to imaging the Flaming Star and the Rosette Nebula with my GT81. We'll talk more about the ASI 2600 after I've had a chance to process the images. I've got a few good nights, maybe two good nights coming up, and I think I'll be able to finish up my hours on the two nebula and then can do some processing and then maybe summarize what I'm my first impressions of the 2600 mm, or at least the new version of the 2600 mm. But that's not what I wanted to talk about today. I actually observed a transient 
anomaly in one of my subframes. And I thought initially that it might have been space debris burning up, but Google sent me to a link from SpaceX about their satellite 35956, also NORAD ID 666, very ominous, uh, 29 is the NORAD ID. And it turned out that Starlink had experienced an anomaly on December 17th, very close to the day that I observed something, my anomaly up in the sky, and it lost contact with the satellite, vented its propellant, and ejected some debris, and now the satellite is mostly intact, but is tumbling and will be re-entering the atmosphere soon. Now, I've tried, but I can't definitively prove that the Starlink 35956 is the one and the same with my anomaly. It certainly seems reasonable. The orbital path passes over, will pass, has passed over my location, which is where it would have to have been for me to have seen it where I saw it, given that it's in such a low Earth orbit, it's going to be fairly close to to my location if looking at it at an angle of about 50 degrees or so. So it seems pretty reasonable that the orbital path of this satellite does in fact fall within my imaging sight line on this day. I just can't prove that it was at that specific time. If it wasn't that anomaly, then it had to be some other anomaly and there's something else going on, but that seems also unlikely. Can't wait too long because the satellite will be burning up any day now, so keep your eyes on the news feeds and look for a Starlink satellite, mention of a Starlink satellite re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and burning up. Okay, guys. Well, that's all I have for this quick video. I'll get back to you with some information on the ASI 2600 uh, very shortly, as soon as I get some processing done. But in the meantime, clear skies, and I don't know, you might want to stay indoors for the next few days. There could be some satellites falling. Take care. See ya.